Greetings scholars, social media marketing scholars, welcome back to the video lecture series. This one covering chapter two, social consumers out of the Tutan and Solomon textbook. So you should have learned and I'm sure you did learn in principles of marketing or as I always say in another marketing class what market segmentation is. This is a definitional slide. This is when marketers divide a market into distinct groups that have common needs and characteristics. And why do we do that? It's because there's a shortage of time and money in this life and we want to make sure that uh, we market to the right people, right? We don't want to market, uh, you know, if we're marketing to gamers, we don't want to be uh, hitting a group of 62-year-old uh, stay-at-home moms, former stay-at-home moms, right? We want to find out uh, what segments of people live in the area where we operate. And if it's on social media, I'd be in the in the United States or in the world so we can so we can market to them so we're going to talk in some ways how we can do that how we can slice and dice up uh, not literally but figuratively uh, the market consumers here's some some of the common uh, bases that we can segment segment uh, the market on we can use geography Right, that's pretty commonsensical. So we can divide by region, country, market size. You know, Coca-Cola has North American uh, divisions. They have South American divisions, right? Because the needs and wants are different, or could be different in different areas. So we can use geography: North Georgia, South Georgia, however you want to do it. We can use demographics. Uh, I could segment. Uh, this particular class up uh, by uh, we could do it by age, do it by gender, we could use marital status, use ethnicity, uh, where you are in the family life cycle, you're single, married, kids, grandkids. Uh, so we can divide up the market that way. We can use psychographics, which is uh, segments of market based on uh, personality or lifestyles. So I usually use, or I have often used in the past, and we'll use again here, Mountain Dew. Uh, Mountain Dew, you know, they market to, uh, you know, people want to do the do, you know, stay hopped up, extreme sports, uh, gamers, that kind of thing. Those are psychographic uh, bases they use to to segment their market. Uh, we can use benefit, which, you know, means, you know, what benefits do they seek uh, from the different products that are offered in the market? For example, let's say that uh, we have a car, right? So you say, well, the benefit of this car is getting from point A to point B. Well, that's, that's, that's true, but uh, if someone's looking for uh, someone's very environmentally uh, conscious or very forward thinking or an early adopter, uh, the benefits they may be looking from a car is they might want an electric car or a hybrid car. So at that point, they're not looking just to get from point A to point B. They're looking to get from point A to point B uh, in the newest technology or in the way that's best for the environment, their mind, their thinking, or whatever. So the benefits two different consumers looking uh, for from the same category, in this case automobiles, uh, can be vastly different. And then last we have behavioral segmentation. So we divide uh, markets to buy consumers up by their actions. So if we were marketing, uh, let's say we're marketing the Atlanta Hawks, we might divide our uh, ticket buyers up by their usage, how many games do they come to a year, 
um, and uh, season ticket holders versus uh, one-off purchasers. Um, how frequently do they purchase? Or we might have customers, where do they purchase? We might focus on people that buy their tickets to a certain venue, uh, a certain place, and not another place. So those would be examples of behavioral uh, segmentation. So we can use those five, and we can use others too. I don't know why the G got dropped off of geotargeting. I put this slide in here as an example. You may have your own examples, depending on what apps you have on your phone. But geotargeting is a uh, yeah. The book mentions that and geo uh, geofencing, but uh, geotargeting is a way to uh, target customers, segment customers based on geography. You know, you can, uh, if you've ever used Waze, you know, if you're using a Waze map and you come to a stop sign, it'll tell you there's a, by the way, in case you're hungry, there's a Chick-fil-A on your left and there's a, you know, Mexican restaurant on your right or whatever. Those are targeting based on your geography. So we have that segmentation basis in the earlier slide of geography. It's just another example, and I'm sorry that, that, that the conversion to collaborate screwed that up. Another concept, and this same idea is a concept called geofencing, which has been in the news recently in Atlanta, uh, because uh, Georgia is thinking about legalizing sports gambling, but only if you're in a sports arena. And they'll use geofencing, which you can read about in the text, uh, to monitor that. In other words, if you were in Truist Park, uh, at a Braves game or just in Truist Park, then you would be able to um, play sports wagers. Or if you were in State, State Farm Arena, right, so you would have to be in a sports venue. That's the way they're trying to uh, get to reduce the hurdles to that from the sports entities in town, that it would bring people into their arena so they could uh, – you know, be like a sports book inside the arena, but outside you couldn't do it. But anyway, loose uh, geo targeting and geo fencing. So let's talk about a social footprint. How does how do you, in this instance, we can use an individual or a firm. How do they look on the internet? What is their what is their footprint? Well, if it's an individual, in this example, they may have a Facebook profile and they have a Twitter feed. You see Gary Garbett. Let's pretend like his name is Gary Garbett. Uh, in the community zone, then over in social publishing, he's got a blog that he calls Naked Doodles. And a YouTube channel, Carburito Studio. And... Uh, then down to social entertainment, he doesn't really participate in that. But he does sell some things on lulu.com and cafepress.com. Uh, so why does it matter how you appear on the Internet? Well, from a business perspective, you can share a lot of information. I'm going to come back to the earlier slide in just a moment. Uh, you can share a lot of information about yourself. We're going to talk about privacy in a minute, but if you're a firm, uh, you want that to be the right thing. In other words, things that make a difference or that help that help your business. You don't want to do it haphazardly. Well, why is that? Well, you want to create a a profile across the internet that's easily remembered and located so let's take for example if we have a, a, we're starting a business and we go to the first social media channel that we think we're gonna it's gonna be our our main horse to advertise and publicize about our business what kind of thoughts should we put into what our username is or our handle or our digital brand 
Well, you should put more into it than most people do because you want your digital brand name, your handle to be preferably the same across multiple formats. You don't want to use, you know, at Gary Garvin on Twitter, but that's not available on Etsy. So it's at Gary Garbit one, two, three, four. And then, you know, another place is at G Garbit six, seven, eight, nine. You get the point. There are places that you can pay to check that, and there are places you can use for free if you have that knowledge. So, first of all, before you even pick a name or a handle, you would like to make sure it's available across multiple platforms. In other words, you can use it on Facebook, uh, Pinterest, uh, Instagram, or, or wherever you wherever you plan on operating. I've given you a link to one right here, noam.com. If you go there, you'll get a you'll get an entry screen that doesn't look quite like this. But you can see that I have entered in, I have a, uh, just as an example, I have a uh, online radio station. It's called Cosmic American Radio. So, um, I mean, it's been up for several years. So, did I do this when I did it? No. I've been pretty lucky uh, that I've been able to keep the handles across platforms pretty close, but they're not exactly, I wish they were all the same, but you can see if I enter in, you know, you could enter in whatever you want to, whatever your business will be. I entered in Cosmic American Radio here. Just remember when you entered in, if you go here, uh, no spaces because handles don't generally have spaces, you know, they might have underscore, but, and this is what the search came up for Cosmic American Radio. You can see that CosmicAmericanRadio.com is not available. That's because I own that. Uh, but if I was just starting from scratch, I would say, okay, well, I want it to be .com, so that's no good. But org is available. Ag, name, tell, you see. And you can also search social networks with a uh, title that you put in on Known to, and it'll tell you. They also have paid versions. But you can look and say, okay, I want to be on, you know, these four platforms. Let me check this name, you know, uh, Gino's Garage or something. You can check it across all those platforms to see if it's available. And then if it is, go ahead and get them. Or you might want to change it a little bit. Gino's American Garage or Gino's Import Garage or um, Import Gino. Well, that wouldn't make sense, but you get the point. Uh, you want to check those before you start to make sure that uh, similar names, so you don't have to use different handles across a bunch of different platforms. So in marketing, uh, to make it easier for people to understand, uh, a lot of times we'll create personas. And a persona is a name that we give to a group of people. Uh, to make it and this more, this is kind of descriptive of who they are. Okay, this is I go into more of this on the video, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But uh, so sometimes we will use that to segment the market. In other words, let's say this guy's name is Chris, and we have this information about him. We may categorize people like Chris, Chris, and others. Let's say this is he's. A, He's he's worth uh, he's, he's worth a lot of money, but I don't know if he's worth a lot of money. He's CEO of a financial firm, so he's probably getting paid well. Uh, we have some things he likes to communicate. He likes to use email, face to face, or by phone. Uh, boy, that's not me. Uh, he's on LinkedIn and Twitter, and uh, you see eight people involved in his purchase decisions for his firm, or whatever what he doesn't want, what he wants to know, and he's like that. So we may use all those data points and create a persona called uh, uh, our best male customer, or maybe we call him, uh, I don't know, we can, we can make up whatever you wanted to. And then in our discussions, uh, we may uh, 
say, okay, well, this this advertising campaign is geared toward the our best male customer persona that we require. Well, maybe we call them a big fish or something like that. So to that end, here's a couple of uh, links that uh, you can bookmark or download and use. But I've posted a video, so I'm going to skip by this, uh, of uh, segmentation tools, two free ones that you can use, and uh, explain how they work in a video that's posted on the learning management system. It's under, uh, I have chapter two in the title because it relates to this, but it's, uh, it's one where you can, one's using the census, called Quick Facts. The other one is using the uh, tapestry, the Claritas 360 segments tool, where you can put in uh, your zip code, and you can see by zip code what sort of people live in that zip code and their education, uh, their living arrangements, things like that. And it's kind of an example you can use to see how those are very, these are very base level uh, examples of tools that, that you can use yourself that imagine Target has much more elaborate tools where they peg it right down to, you know, the subset of the zip code that they use to know where they want to open stores based on, based on the segments they have done research on that are their best segments. So watch that video and, uh, you can play around with those tools, and you'll find it fun. I think some of you maybe don't find anything fun, but uh, you can also use it in real life. You could use it for your own business or at work and really impress uh, some people with a couple of things just because you know where to find them. So anyway, go take a look at that video, and I go through it and show you the kind of things you can see and find about, you know, if you just want to do it for fun to see about your neighborhood, where you live. So we also are interested in why people, why people use social media, their motives. That can help us target people. It'll help us segment a market, and we may be more interested in one group over another, and the reason they use social media can help us with that. Uh, this slide mentions six. There are others, which again, I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But for these six, they start with the affinity impulse, right? A lot of times people use social media because uh, they want to be connected with certain people or brands or products or things or places, and they want people to see it. Or they want to be connected to some reference groups, right? So their social identity, uh, like you know, wanting to stay connected with your high school or college friends on social media, maybe a, a political group on Twitter or something like that. Personal utility. It's pretty simple. What's in it for me? In other words, you're not interested in a social media platform that has nothing in it for you. You're not getting anything out of it. That ties into uses and gratifications theory, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Contact, comfort, and immediacy. When you text someone, are you staring at your phone waiting for them to text you back? Or if you text your boyfriend or girlfriend, you feel better when they text you back. Oh, I know where she is. Okay, I know what she's doing. She still cares about me or he still cares about me, whatever. That's contact, comfort, and immediacy. If you feel like if you haven't checked Instagram in the last 10 minutes that you're anxious and nervous, that might be one of your prime motives for using social media. Altruism. Uh, that's people that want to do something good. Maybe they their primary motive or a motive for them is you know donating cash when there's a when there's an emergency or a need. Uh, they think they can do 
good or they can participate in a little virtue signaling. Look, I participated in this fundraiser. I'm a good person. Curiosity. They may, these users may want to gain knowledge. All right, I, I used, I had to look up a YouTube video yesterday to, to try to shut the water off to my house because my irrigation system got struck by lightning. That's crazy, but true. Uh, so that's one type of curiosity. Another is uh, maybe you have a, a prurient impulse. You just like to creep around, see what people are doing. You're not wanting to learn how to fix your refrigerator. You're just wanting to see what he or she is doing. And that can be a very strong impulse and a motive for using social media. And then lastly, they talk about validation or feeding one's ego. Did she or he comment on the picture I posted of myself at the beach? Uh, you know, did, did, my, did my girlfriends say, oh, you're so cute in that picture or whatever. Uh, that's validation. So there are six. A person I know, namely myself, uh, and a co-author, Anita Whiting, wrote a paper a couple years ago where we examined why people use social media and we used a uses and gratifications, we used a theory called uses and gratifications, which is a communications theory, uh, which says people use things uh, because they get something out of it. If they don't get something out of it, they tend not to use it as much. So we explored what people said, or what, what people said, why people said they use social media, is what I meant to say. And we found these 10, which somewhat overlap with the previous six that we just talked about. And uh, it led with social interaction, uh, information seeking, right, which could be, you know, using uh, Yelp or something to find information or using the cartwheel app at Target, see what's on sale. Some people just are burning time, which we called pastime. Entertainment, I think we all, well, I don't know if we all use it for that, but I do. I know a lot of people do. More than half of our study group did. Relaxation, uh, they found it was relaxing going through profiles. You know, that doesn't, not really one of my prime motives, but express opinions, that makes sense. A lot of people do that. Some people just lurk and don't express opinions. Some people are looking to express their opinion, whether you're interested in it uh, or not. Uh, communicatory utility. Uh, you know, you talk with others. Maybe people that don't normally or don't see face to face anymore, but they, you know, they used to communicate or chat or gossip. Uh, convenience. Um, that's right, 24/7. You can, you can get on there, and there's always somebody active on social media around the world. So there's always new things. Uh, sharing information, or what we call information sharing, which can involve some seeking as well. Uh, and then last, uh, surveillance or knowledge about others, which is uh, spy on people, or people said that they were being nosy or creeping on people. So some of those overlap with the previous six motives that I talked about that the authors mentioned. And we found some new ones, which is the reason that the that the article was is so highly cited and people have used it to go on and further the work. Um, so let's talk about privacy. That's a, that's a hot topic with respect to uh, social media. Have people worried about their privacy and their, you know, they try to scare people all the time on ads on television, social media about, you know, someone stealing your home or whatever because of the information they find online. It's just some stats. Uh, almost, you know, nine out of ten people posted a real name on their profiles, selfies, birth dates, 
where to go to school, all those type, all those types of things, which leads to uh, what researchers have referred to as the privacy paradox, because most social media users, when surveyed, uh, have talked about that they uh, are worried about their privacy and they would like to protect their privacy online and blah blah blah. At the same time, they have no problem uh, having their profiles being public or email addresses or where they live. It's not quite understood, but it's one of those things that people profess to be interested in, but maybe they aren't really. Hence, the paradox. Say you're interested in privacy, but yet you don't mind sharing all your personal information on social media. Are you really that interested in it? Something to think about. Forrester research, uh, which led to a book by Lee and Bernoff, they created through research, or they defined some social media segments, as did Pew, which is a big research firm. And it's a good place to find, if you're interested in social media uh, research, uh, Pew Internet Research is a good site to look at. Uh, if you're ever interested in, you know, what sort of people use Pinterest the most, uh, how many people use social media, that type of thing. They research solely in that area, and it's very interesting. You might could use it for work. I'm going to talk about them both real quick. The uh, Forrester Research first, they came up with the social technographics ladder uh, where they, through the research about why people were using, again, I don't know why this is over here. I'm going to go ahead and draw it to your attention because that's on my nerves. It's an E. I don't know why that's over there. And they found that it starts from 70% of the subjects that is completely inactive on social media, right? So that's an oddity, but, you know, there's a group of people, like 17% of uh, Americans is not active, and it goes up to creators, which are the most involved, and they are uploading video and publishing a blog and uh writing songs and put them on SoundCloud or uh, writing articles, maybe it's for their job or maybe it's not. It's just a hobby they have. Um, so you can see the range from inactives through spectators, joiners, collectors, critics, conversationalists, and creators. Now, you may be, if you look at these, you may have a category you may be interested, not interested. You may appear in each of these, or maybe three or three out of four of them, right? So they're not discrete, uh, separate ones. So uh, let's say that uh, I'll take myself. I do listen to podcasts. I do watch video. I will read an online forum. I do look at customer ratings and reviews, and I'm a big Twitterer. Okay, and that's also the biggest group. So I can see that. Maintain a profile on a social networking site and visit social networking site. Guilty. Uh, I don't do too much of this. I do use RSS feeds for a few. I will post a rating from time to time, but I'm not consistent about it. Uh, and that might be my biggest one there. I will. I'll put myself in here because let's say that tweeting at someone or responding to one would do. Uh, I, I use these, but not not for those purposes. But I do uh, have a blog, I have a web page. I will upload video. I do have a radio station. I'm gonna all this so. So I'm involved in up and down the ladder. All right, so that's one way to look at uh, people on the uh, on social media. 
and then Pew also uh, in their research they they created these internet technology types which include at the bottom mobile newbies more interested in, the, in other words they might on their phone there they might be reading uh, let's say the Atlanta Journal Constitution that's the biggest thing they do right so uh, female 50s lower educational income levels roving nodes uh, they're connected but they're really only connected because work makes them makes them be if it wasn't for work they're not really that personally connected media movers uh, create content and that can be you know everybody in this class may be a content creator in other words they've posted pictures to Instagram and uh, that would count right uh, ambivalent networkers and digital collaborators they use them at work at play create and share they're all over they're all over the internet and you see the key demographics here mostly male late 30s well educated relatively high incomes so through their late 30s we would probably categorize them as digital natives they've always they've always known the internet as opposed to digital immigrants which I am a digital immigrant I did not uh, my family or didn't have